Hello everyone, welcome back to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. If you're joining us for the first time, what a privilege it is to have you with us, with the UK's leading pro-marriage organisation, representing tens of thousands of individuals and groups from all faiths and none. The thing that draws us together is support and promotion of this thing, one man, one woman marriage. We think it's special, we think it's unique, we think all the data agrees. Uh, it's not a value judgment, it's not a moral statement, it's not even a preference from that point of view. It's the fact that the data Data seems to say that's what brings about the best version of the next generation and we need to champion it and recognize it as such and we know that sometimes marriages don't work out adultery abuse abandonment etc but we've got to find a way of letting people know that marriage really is the key to a successful future for individuals for families and indeed for the nation now back in the days when all this was being debated and redefined in 2012 2013 there was a man who came to the fore in parliament who ended up championing the cause of mad woman marriage that man was david burrows uh, david it's a real pleasure to have you with us today would you like to tell us a bit about yourself uh, so there's, there's, there's different hats you can address me to david a former mp for for southgate um i'm founder and now parliamentary director of the conservative christian fellowship and the prime minister's deputy special envoy for freedom of religion or belief but you can use any or none of those <laughs> <laughs> or just the fact that i'm father of six married to janet uh Elder at Town Community Church, anything, yeah, you want. Fantastic. Yeah, all those different hats, quite right too. And so let's, I mean, let's let's maybe start by looking back. And for those who maybe don't know much about the well, I say history, it's it's not ten years ago yet, really, uh, that all this kind of came into into place. Um you seem to be, from an MP's perspective, right at the heart of the argument against the redefinition of marriage to include same-sex couples. Uh, and first of all, before we, we go into how that came about and, and the, the process, why was this something so close to your heart, so close, in fact, that you were willing to put really everything on the line to defend it? Um, marriage uh, matters, uh, absolutely. Uh, marriage matters because it matters to God. It's, it's been there from the beginning. It's uh, quite rightly and understandably an ordained institution that reflects the character of God and wonderfully demonstrates uh, our Lord Jesus Christ's relationship with his people. And we can look forward to that perfect marriage in heaven. So it's entwined in the beginning, the during and the end of everything. So it is, it matters and it is defining and it uh, mattered to me personally um, uh, as a Christian. Uh, I took that seriously and do take that seriously. And so, so I always have had that concern. From a point of view of being a, uh, a Christian in politics, it was one of those central aspects to stand, being a member of parliament and standing up for marriage and the family. I made that clear every time I stood for election that that was a core essence of what I stood for. And it was also one of those issues which needed and does need contending for because there are too few people who are willing to speak up for marriage. Uh, interestingly, it's not just in politics, but it's also uh, in our church communities and how much we um, have that responsibility to advocate outside of our indeed church family to, uh, to others about the importance of marriage because it's not just for the sake of Christians' marriage, it's for the sake of the world. And that's the essence of it. So why I had every authority as a politician to speak up for what I thought and do do consider is for the common good and for the benefit of everyone, not least my constituents who I sought to be elected uh, to represent and then in Parliament as well. And that um, is an interesting aspect. I, we can talk further about the opposition that came way before the Same-Sex Marriage Act, but it's an issue that is needs to be contended for and is is contentious. Mm, absolutely. And and so from, from our point of view now, as, as, as the Coalition for Marriage has progressed, we very much focus on the secular evidence. You mentioned it's it's good for the world. And again, every every person I speak to every week, we we recognize the fact that the, the evidence is very clear that the 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 greatest predictor for happiness for adults is marriage. The greatest or the best predictor for good outcomes for children is growing up with your married 
mum and dad and, and that's not a moral statement it's not a it's not a, um, a religious conviction although I may be a Christian as well it's just a matter of the evidence and the data which is abundantly clear that there's something about marriage and growing up with your your married mum and dad together that brings about the best version of the next generation and that's why it's so valuable to society maybe and that's why you know we damage it at our peril I agree and, and it's good not just for those who are married but it's good for uh, the whole uh, society, it's a central uh, building block of society and it's one that we need to be supporting whether we're in marriage or not and the, the, the wider benefits of supporting marriage and, and the values that uh, develop from that. There's, there's values that are reflected of a Lord's character, of sacrifice, of putting others first, of serving um, uh, all those kind of values that can imbue a society are really important. So let's let's wind it back then to two thousand and four, maybe. Let's let's maybe start there. You could start, you could start at various points in history, but two thousand and four, um, when uh, the government, uh, in return for granting uh, civil partnership rights to to gay couples, um, uh, said, "Well, look." Uh, it, it's only fair that, that couples who commit to each other who happen to be same-sex attracted uh, are given the same rights uh, and obligations as married couples. Now, the whole argument around that is another whole argument, maybe. Um, but at the time, that was deemed uh, something which was uh, acceptable in civil society and the right thing to do. And the promise in return was given, don't worry, this will never affect marriage. Um, and and it seemed uh, within a very short period of time that promise was not only broken but just blatantly and boldly shattered with no remorse or regret from those who were doing it. Perhaps I don't know. Can you are you able to give us a little? How do we get from two thousand and four to two thousand and thirteen? Yeah, so, so it's interesting because it's it's different. The journeys into legalizing same sex marriage has been different for the UK than other countries. Mm. And, um, you know, we, we came from the basis of the fact that there was pretty much, a, well, effectively equal legal rights for same-sex couples as marriage couples. That's where we landed in 2013. Now, I, I was elected in 2005, and I remember being involved in various aspects of that. And whilst actually wanting to respect, the, as, a, as a matter of law, that there's a, there, are, there are rights that need to be are given to all kinds of relationships, not least same-sex relationships, that there was also a need to always recognise that um, whilst there's, there can be an equalisation in, in legal rights, that there was still a, specifically not a, as was for some, it was not just a campaign of, of equalising marriage uh, across the board. And, and uh, we saw in different areas of debate around, for example, adoption of couples uh, and how that's handled uh, in relation to married couples and uh, same and civil partnerships that there was different elements where one would ordinarily have exclusively seen a marriage as being preeminent or uh, ideal whichever way you want to call it whilst fully respecting other rights there was a chipping away of those aspects um, so we were at a situation in 2013 where there are, there are opportunities for same-sex couples to adopt, um, to obviously live together with full rights, including inheritance and other rights as well. Um, and only, I suppose, there was only an element around tax where there's some distinction, um, but not really much. And so we were at a situation where, um, and in fact, debates I was having at a very senior level where people were not very clear about what they thought particularly the exclusive value of marriage was because they couldn't necessarily just hold it out to be a place for child raising when in some ways law had allowed that to be equalised. Um, and there'd also been debates around obviously the IVF and different ways of, of having children. There's opportunities that, you know, that, that aren't exclusive to married couples. Um, and so, so there, there was a... That there needs to be a clarity on that, which we can debate about where, how much the church has helped support or not that. Um, but yes, we're in a situation where we, we ended up in 2000, well, October 2012, when um, the uh, coalition government was in place. There was no manifest commitment to do it, but uh, David Cameron, to the surprise of many, decided to announce, and I think he wanted to get ahead 
of the Liberal Democrat colleagues to say, yes, we're going to now legislate for same-sex couples. And um, he made the famous statement that um, I believe in this, um, uh, not despite being conservative, but because I'm conservative. And, and that then led to a big debate in internally in our, my party conservatives and also a wide debate in the country. And, and that took us to... To, to where we were in 2013 and the legislation. I, I mean, we can, we, I don't know if there's anything you want to say about the campaign. I, yeah. I noticed that uh, the campaign was, was imbalanced in many ways, you know, because you have, on the one hand, you have uh, simple platitudes like love is love, which uh, is meaningless really, and actually can mean some very, very sinister things. Um, so you, you've got that on the one side compared to, well, actually, you've got to look at the evidence for marriage and its value and this thing that one man and one woman can do that nobody else can do on the other side. And then, of course, outside of the, the stats and the logic and the argument, you have the vitriol. And I know that you you endured some particularly vile forms of attack and hatred. Uh, simply for voicing your opinion that marriage between a man and a woman is a good thing. Uh, mm. And of course, you know, you, you didn't give as good as you got or as bad as you got. And nobody on, on that side did because that's not how you behave. So talk a little bit about the, the balance of the discussion and the debate. Yeah, I'm mean, so sorry. I ended up um, leading the parliamentary opposition to the bill. I didn't necessarily... <laughs> Uh, uh, wish on that, but, uh, but I've you know, felt passionately concerned, as I said, about marriage. I wanted to make sure, make sure I approached it with love and with truth and respect. Um, I'm, I mean, there is a ritual, ritual on both sides. You know, there has been significant abuse um, and hatred, sadly, to um, homosexuals in time gone by and continues in different ways. And I, for example, used to campaign in my schools uh, very much against bullying of all forms, including homophobic bullying. And so there's ways that we need to be recognising all of that. Um, so I, I made, made, wanted to stand very respectfully, but truthfully and lovingly on this issue. I ended up um, leading this 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 campaign, and um, and it wasn't wasn't reciprocated all the way through. You're right because it led to lots of abuse. How dare I stay, take a stand? What a, some people expressed surprise, which they shouldn't have done. That I was. Speaking up on behalf of marriage, I made it very clear all the way through that that's what I cared about passionately, and um, and people didn't think I had a right even almost to take that view. And certainly there was lots of abuse, saying I was bigoted, I was homophobic, and that I should die for my views. Yes, death threats. So, so I was death threats, um, and those were quite specific around my transportation plans. And as you'll see from me talking here, they weren't successful. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I remember quite amusingly, it's just um, I changed my transport plans, was in, in a train rather than a tube, and suddenly there was a big rush towards me by this man in a black hood and a cape. And I thought, oh dear. And it actually ended up as one of the local parish priests who just wanted to give me a hug for my stand. Oh. And, um, so that was very nice of him. I was about yeah, to. Yeah. Deck him on the floor, but um, the um, but look, I mean, it was a shame. I mean, I, in some ways, as said, as lots of people have seen in lots of other areas, it does uh, taking a stand does lead to abuse, particularly online. But this is what one has to put up with. It got obviously uh, totally over, uh, over the line in terms of death threats, and actually, what was particularly over the line was the abuse that was handed out at my children for for their father's views, and they 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 had to. Um, understand a little bit about what it is to, to take a stand on issues. So that was a great shame. I mean, it has to be said in Parliament, mostly there was a level of respect and debate. And um, whilst I did get accused of um, being equivalent to the slave traders by one member of Parliament, and I had to remind him that actually William Wilberforce um, campaigning against the slave trade would have probably been on my side of the argument on this one. Um, so sometimes it went over the top, but what we were concerned about was to um, defend uh, marriage and saw it not just as an equalisation issue, but an issue of redefinition of marriage and what marriage is about, but also make sure there were sufficient protections in place to allow people to take that stand. It was a matter of a right to speak, to have that belief, as much as the issue of marriage itself. And we tried to ensure that, that was as best as we could uh, protect it within legislation. Yeah. And, and the things that, I mean, the changes, of course, that, that had to come about because of 
uh, uh, introducing same-sex marriage, uh, the, the fact that uh, adultery was effectively removed because there, there was no sex act defined for uh, same-sex couples. So it, it really changed marriage into something, instead of something which uniquely kind of protected that thing which only one man and one woman can do is you know come together and create a new life and the idea of encouraging them to raise that life together because it brings about the best outcomes that was stripped away from marriage and it suddenly became you know adultery effectively was removed the sex act was removed and it suddenly became a just a, a government register of who likes who at any point in time and nobody seemed or very few seemed to see the problem with that I mean, I certainly raised it at, at a very high level and it got into some of the intricate details around uh, evidencing adultery and the like and how inevitably it was very hard to put that definition into a same-sex relationship into legislation. But it highlighted really that once you unpick marriage and essential aspects to it, as has happened, as it happened already in other legislation, but to this point, you end up having a much looser definition of marriage and once you start to, you know, undermine the foundations, you know, it inevitably it affects the institution uh, or indeed affects other people's view around how man and women relate to each other, how you identify man and woman and those relationships that follow. And obviously marriage is a, is a marriage of between a man and a woman. It, it wonderfully reflects that complementary character of our Lord Jesus Christ to us. And it also reflects between a man and a woman, that complementary character and definition around the sexual act, yes, and around how we relate to each other. And once you start unpicking that and unraveling that in legislation, um, it, it has a serious effect. And we've seen Look what happened. impacts of that yeah, sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, I think at the time you you raised the, the rather prescient comments of the then head of Stonewall, who, who uh, foretold that this wouldn't work out well for... LGBT people. Interesting, yeah. I mean, he uh, it wasn't the big issue for Stonewall at the time. They were campaigning about homophobic bullying and it kind of came uh, through other lobbying groups uh, coming in, getting in, trying to make a position statement. And in some ways, it was a wider issue of trying to mainstream issues for LGBT community rather than actually marriage. It was more concern around mainstreaming uh, rather than um, marriage itself. You know, Before, during and after, I haven't seen a whole lot of the of Stonewall of the LGBT community campaigning hard for marriage as an institution, for the, it to be supported and encouraged. That hasn't happened because it was almost a land grab for a wider mainstreaming issue. And they themselves were worried that what it would do in the, in the words of the chief executive then, that it would put us all in our trenches and wouldn't actually support uh, in the long term um, what they were concerned about, which was individuals who were being discriminated for and, and would lead to um, lots of battles. Now, if we move things on to the big debates now, it's around gender issues, transgenderism, and about how one views men and particularly women. Um, but I would date that back um, to it being turbo boosted and undermined by our lack of clarity and understanding about marriage. Very much so. And, and removing the essential role of, of sex and gender, if you can conflate those two terms, really. You know that uh, the the role of male and female. You undermine it and say, well, actually, it doesn't. You know, doesn't. You don't have to have a male and a female. You can have an anything and an anything because it's just about two people, and and that that turns into what we've got today, really. Yes, and um, you could argue that some would argue that there's a role for a civil secular state to be able to give some bond, um, some legal agreement to same-sex couples. Um, heterosexual couples, and then the, you leave the, the religions to be able to get on with what, how they want to, to deal with it. Now, there, but we haven't come that way, and, and we, we've, we've come from a Christian heritage with a church of England established, and in canon law, it was that was the law of the land. And what was defining was that the law of the land and canon law broke away at that point. And so we decided to unhook ourselves from that key element of Christian heritage and go our own ways. And, you know, we can judge whether those were good. Now, some people would say, hey, I was able to have that, that same-sex marriage, that blessing, and that's led to some degree of uh, normalisation and I feel that I have an equality and a value of love is equal kind of thing. You can argue that to one extent, but there's a much more fundamental issue that needs to be cherished around the institution of marriage and how 
it has been impacted, not least in our relationship between each other and what, how we view men and women and sex and gender. And there were some pretty uh, good uh, legal um, defences implemented at the same time. So uh, as well as the quadruple lock, which we, we could talk about, but also, you know, comments in the in the um, uh, the the Public Order Act, for example, you know, that that um, discussion of, of uh, sexual practices or, or marriage or the parties to a marriage is not in and of itself evidence of 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 hatred or, or stirring up of, of anything violent or anything else like that. Absolutely. And and that's still got to be contended for that, you know, when one stands up and speaks up for marriage between a man and a woman, that does not in any way imply issues of hate or bigotry or homophobia. And there's every right to do that. Yet that that is being attacked as we speak. The idea of a, a ban on so-called conversion therapy. If if you dare to say that something is wrong, that you feel it's wrong or you disagree with something, that then becomes constituted hate. Yeah, I mean, look, that's, that's got a long way to go. I and mean, that's the spectrum and the fear, but that wouldn't be legislated on, in my view, certainly not this government, to, to, to enable that to take place. But that is a fear and a worry that one, if one starts to delve into issues of free speech like that, then you, 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 it's a very dangerous course of action. And, and the issue, though, is the chill factor that comes out, that people are scared. In fact, even when I was contending for the issue, my wife said, just checked in whether I was doing the right thing. Uh, in the school gate and, and the folk there said well look we certainly agree with David's view on marriage but no we wouldn't say it in public now that was in 2013 and we have to ask ourselves as a church and it's something which the CFM have been involved in obviously to galvanize that support for marriage is that we need to be advocating positively for it as much as what we're against what we're in favor of and that really matters it does matter and again something which I, I mentioned probably too frequently is a, is a comres um, anonymous survey of MPs in, in uh, October 2018, where over half of those who responded said they were too fearful to speak their mind over LGBT issues. And, and you just think, oh, I mean, they saw what happened to you, right? And anyone else who dares say anything against the mob, uh, small but vociferous though they be, uh, and people think, well, you know, at the end of the day, I have to be a populist to, to get elected. Therefore, I'm just I'm too scared to go there. Now that presumably they're too scared to vote in line with their consciences if they didn't even speak in line with them. Possibly, I think things have shifted a bit. Then people are you've got Miriam Cates and others who are bravely yes, yes, yeah. others yeah, have the, 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 the yeah, turned. The, and obviously, myself as front director of the front director of the Conservative Christian Fellowship, trying to make sure that there is that space, and indeed cross party for people to contend for their not least Christian views. Um, but, but we need to watch that. And it's, maybe it's even what well, it is. I think even you know, in the workplaces, in the corners, um, away from such a public g g glare, there is, I think, that real worry that people feel cowed out to speak what they think uh, are their truthful views around oh, marriage. Very much so. Yeah. And there's the whole debate about education at the moment and, and uh, grossly inappropriate materials being shared with young children in schools uh, up and down the country. And the fear factor is there when I go up, I, I get a privilege of talking to thousands of people up and down the country with this job, David. And what what I get is that people are sometimes too scared to say anything. They're too scared that their child will be vilified. They're too scared that they'll be called out as a homophobe, as a parent, just for saying, I'm not sure I want my, my child to see that. That's that sort of material in, in that kind of graphic, gross detail. I'm not sure it's appropriate. And there is that, there's still that fear factor. So it's good that people like Miriam and others um, yeah. are, are making a stand. But what about the church then? Because <laughs> while they were given a, a triple lock, you think, well, there's no way anyone from outside is opening that. But, oh, they'll open it from the inside. Well, that's a bit awkward. Um, what's going on inside the, the established church? Hey, it was either that's in some ways. I mean, yeah. I, I, I didn't get that much support from the established church when I was contending for their canon law in part. Yeah. Um, it's actually it's more, more support from the Catholics, um, yeah. but um, so so they've always been uh, somewhat equivocal for what is such an ordained institution. It matters in many ways. There's no hierarchy as much as church, mm. marriage, and indeed political authorities as well, for that matter. So, um, I mean, there's still you know it's, it's it's still a contestable issue. It's still a split issue. The laity is still pretty much uh, just majority in favour of keeping the lock and don't want the bishops to go down unpicking it. 
obviously you'll get parliamentarians who are um, who are and worryingly some of them who are getting involved in doctrine of the church to say what they think the church should do um, and that's the worry really I mean there still is very much the preserve where the church can come to its determined view on the basis of of historical biblical doctrine and that's what they should be doing I you know as baptized for members in Anglican Church I'm now an independent but nevertheless I fully was I love, love it in many ways I've got ordained ministers family in there and for their sakes and others for the sake of their historical mission not least around marriage to as a as a common good uh, something that is good for society good for the UK they should be standing up for its foundations and it's of deep concern that they um, are playing a, a fast and loose with such an important institution um, and so so I, I still hope and pray that um, they will not unpick that lock and that they will um, respect the rights of many, many thousands of, of Christians and Anglicans who um, affirm what the clear biblical uh, mandate in relation to marriage. Yeah, that's right. So uh, in terms of where to from here in that case, uh, I mean, I, I, had, I do have the privilege of speaking to lots of people uh, on these podcasts and, and in person up and down the country, but also a member of lots of groups. And if I'm honest, a lot of those groups are hand-wringing uh, but in terms of making progress, what I mean, ma marriages have fallen forty percent since the nineties. You know, we know that that it's in a it's in a desperate state, and we know the value of marriage. And we, you look around at the ramifications of of the reduction in number of marriages. You look at, I think, uh, only this morning I was reading a report in Wales where I live of teachers in a school refusing to teach because. They just simply can't control the behavior of the out of control uh, students in the school. Uh, and the parents saying, well, it's your job. They may be hard to handle, but that's your job. Uh, or the parent, let me say, not parents. Um, and you just think, well, the schools are falling apart because the kids are falling apart, which means society is falling apart. Can nobody see that maybe there's a connection and it's more than just a correlation between that and kids not generally growing up with their biological mum and dad these days? Yeah, that, that, that is, that's all a sad reflection of, of, of a fracturing in society and fracturing of relationships. You know, we I was involved in uh, developing family hubs around the country, which are relationship based to help and support families and parents in those relationships. Um, I just think we need to hold, we need to look at ourselves um, critically. And I, I just don't think churches up and down the land have done enough to sell marriage and to have it as their mission. We have lots of quite right projects around dealing with issues of debt, of poverty, of, of social justice issues. But how much do we have projects around marriage, which is a social justice issue? Sadly, the marriage has become a preserve of well, the wealthy. It's a great and social, and, and, and this is a thing. And, and I think it was the the um, the Marriage Foundation who recently yeah. came out with the figures that ninety percent of the richest mothers are married, only twenty percent of the poorest mothers are yeah. married. Now imagine the effect that's having on the kids involved. Huge, you know. So we, so we, and I just don't think how much do we think it as our mission in our community to to promote marriage to you know there's been talk about Miriam Cates and Fiona Bruce simply have been involved in trying to support cheaper marriages more accessible ones in a sense that it shouldn't be the cost of the of the reception that puts you off there's there's aspects to that there's aspects of of marriage preparation of of encouraging at an early age people's understanding expectation it still is an aspiration of young people it's still talked about a lot in across the media um it's still one it's still fated you still have lots of um lots of tv programs about the dream of being married and getting your bride yep. or groom yep. Yep. Um, but we need to match that dream with the reality and help people to go into marriage and not to get married to prepare for it well to have courses that keep people going have mot's of staying in marriage and and I just don't think we do enough as, as, as this should be an as, a key aspect of our DNA as Christians. So we should be out there proclaiming marriage because it is a gospel priority. It's a gospel issue that sadly is dividing the church. And it's because it reflects our Lord's character and what he's about with his church, with his people. And so we must reflect that it's a, it's a great gospel opportunity to, to preach the gospel about how God loved the world so much that he died for his people, that he served and loved them so much, that beautiful love that is reflected in marriage and we can look forward to when he comes again. All of that just leans and on our, you know, a way that we can reach our community that's lost. So we must do more. 
yeah yeah that's very good and you, the idea that the second part of the great commission which people tend to forget which is and teaching them everything i taught you which yeah. is like oh yeah i forgot that bit uh, and the idea of being salt in our society and Excuse trying me. to stop the rate of decay and getting yeah. involved and in, yeah. in all sorts of you know school governors um you know trustees of, of organizations turning up to your local health board yeah. whatever just getting involved you know um and dare i say even politically Absolutely. Uh, not, not everyone can stand to be a candidate, no. uh, but actually when you think of the small numbers of people who exert influence at local constituency level, well, you know, get a bunch of your friends and turn up to whichever party is your choice and have an effect. Yeah, and there's websites to find out more, Christians in Politics, I'm on the Christians yeah, on the Conservative Christian Fellowship side, there's Christians on the left, Christian Liberal Liber Democrat Forum, or... You know, there is a real way that Christians who are used to lots of meetings and engagement and advocacy can really show our Lord's love for others in a very real way. Yeah, it would be nice, though, if we could just get the government to to recognize publicly what they know privately is true because they know the stats and they do it themselves, that actually marriage is a good thing. And to, to try and, you know, sidestep the fact that, yes, there are some people who will be offended by that very comment. But, but actually, we've got to recognise what brings about the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people, including those who would be offended, is by, is by encouraging that, because it is the best thing for the, the best version of the next generation. Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, listen, well, it's such a privilege to talk to you. Um, Thank you. Talk to you. Can, I, can I thank you on behalf of our tens of thousands of supporters for everything you've done, everything you are doing, and, you know, I hope everything you will do in the future, <laughs> because this battle is far from over. And with people like you in the, in the, in the fray, well... No, thank you very much. And thank you much, CPM, for all their support during that campaign when we got, what, 600,000 or so who signed petitions. Um, and we just need to make sure that we keep contending, keep advocating. We must keep up being for marriage and we must use um, the call and commission that we have uh, to tell others to love others. And that must, a key aspect to that must be about uh, telling others and loving others because marriage matters. Thank you. Yeah. David Burrows, you are a walking, breathing hero for marriage. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. All the best. Bye-bye. Take care.